hi everybody and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. You know, last week we talked about all the things that we can learn about Jesus that showed that he was fully human. And um, it just, it touched me a lot because I know that he can truly understand what it feels like to be us. He's experienced life like that, you know. God the Son knows in a very real way what it's like. It was such a blessing to me going to church last Sunday because our pastor preached on the same subject the same day that I was sharing about it with my Tea with Jesus. And we certainly didn't confer about it. In fact, you know, he had planned his way ahead of time. Um, and I was very touched by it. And um, it's good for us to understand that Jesus truly understands us. He knows what things feel like. He was very rejected at times. He was born under very difficult circumstances. So we can know that he truly has compassion and not just sympathy, but empathy with what we experience. But this week, I want to also really look at what the scriptures say about the fact that, yes, Jesus was a human person who came here to earth as a baby, but Jesus was also God the Son. And we can look at a lot of scriptures that will really back that up. So we will be getting back into Acts again, but I wanted to really talk about Jesus, the one whose birthday is coming up here. The, at least the time we celebrate his birthday is coming up here in um, a very short time now. So one of the things that we can look at, it helps us to understand this, is that um, there's so many names. I'm looking here in this really neat book I have. Um, Rose Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines, this 10th Anniversary Expanded Edition. Very interesting book. And I've got this open because they just have a list here of the different names of God and what those names mean. Um, you know, El Shaddai, uh, the All-Sufficient One, the God of the Mountains, God Almighty, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Um, Jehovah, the, the Yahweh, the, the four, uh, you know, consonants in a row that, um, that God used, referring to himself when he said, I am that I am. And so um, many of these same attributes that are very well known of, of God the Father, of, you know, Almighty God, um, we can look at these in terms of how Jesus is also referred to. It was God himself, Jesus, the Son of God, and like I said, God the Son, who chose to come and take our place so that he would bear all the punishment for our sin. This is so far beyond, um, you know, going before a judge and the judge saying, you know what, you're guilty, and we have to admit we know we are, and then the judge says that the wages, you know, the consequence of this guilt is death. And the death is absolutely um, just. And it has been the verdict that there is now going to be a death sentence. But the judge steps down off of his platform and he says, but I love you and I will take your place in the punishment. That seems pretty incredible. I mean, especially when someone knows, they know they're guilty. But what if, what if you were before your king? Righteous, very good king. And you know that the king is just in declaring that you have punishment worthy of death, that you have done, done things that are worthy of death as a punishment. And that king steps down off of his throne in, in front of all of these witnesses. And he comes to before us and he says, but I love you and I will die in your place. And see, there's an accuser, there's an enemy there who's out for blood and who wants us to be punished for our sins. 
The devil wants this. He delights in hurting us because he delights in hurting God and God loves us. And so here we have a mighty king or an emperor who will come and lay his life down because he loves just one of his subjects. But the truth is so much vastly, incredibly bigger than looking at it with a king and his subject. Because all mighty God has justly said that the wages of our sin is death. And the devil's just crying out for our blood. He wants to destroy us. He wants us to have to pay the consequences for our own disobedience. He's been delighting in that ever since he went to, to even Adam in the garden. He's wanted to hurt us and to destroy what God has wanted in a relationship with us. So he's crying out for our blood. And God the Son, who the Bible says clearly, I can show you this in scripture, was in on creation. There was nothing made apart from him. He steps down to this little creation that he made so tiny and weak compared to him and he says I love you and I though I am God will lay aside my might and my power and I'll be born right there where you are and when that price has to be paid and blood has to be shed so that you can be forgiven. I will let them shed my blood. I will die for you. If we can begin to wrap our head around what it has meant for God to come to us and be born here as a human baby with all the dirt and the blood and the, the difficulties of life. Can we begin to understand the kind of love that, that really represents? If we can begin to see that God came down to us, born a baby, so that he could pay that price, it is the most incredible thing we could ever, ever conceive of. I mean, when we really understand that an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, almighty, wise, amazing God laid his life down for us, <laughs> it's so far beyond a judge or a king, it just staggers my mind. So I want to start out by looking at a very profoundly important place in the Bible to understand this, that not only was Jesus human, but to make that connection and bring that forgiveness, he was also perfect and God, and he did not sin, though he was a human being. Let's go here now to what is technically really the beginning of the story, a whole lot more so than Genesis 1-1 is. Let's go to John 1-1 this disciple that Jesus loved, writing his account about his beloved Savior. I'm actually going to read 14 verses, and I want us to really look at what this is saying here about who Jesus is. Now, we've got to remember, it is clear as a bell from the very beginning that God is using, God wants John to use the term word to represent Jesus. As we read it, you'll realize that's what he's saying. But I don't want that to be confusing from the very beginning. It is Jesus. Kind of a neat thing because it's like the word then becomes something we can hear and understand among us. You know, so that's what Jesus is being called here. 
verse 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, the idea of the Trinity, which is a word we use to describe something that the Bible teaches, you don't see the word Trinity in the scriptures. Um, it's, it's a kind of a tricky concept, but um, God is God. <laughs> but he has three persons, and um, it's not, you know, God plus God plus God equaling three. It's God times God times God equaling one God. In other words, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and God the Father is God. But Jesus is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Father is not Jesus. Um, there is a an incredible unity in it. People try to talk about, um, you know, that... Water can be uh, a liquid or a gas or a um, solid. Um, there's just different ways that people try to describe this, but they are distinct even though they are completely in unity. And so God the Son um, is the one who came here for us. Now, he isn't called the Son of God or God's only begotten Son because God created him or that God was like a physical father to him because that's not what it talks about with God being a father. But begotten, the only begotten, um, is better translated that it's, it's his only true son and heir. Um, Jesus is, is in that place of honor at the right hand of the father as God, the son, the heir, um, the great prince of heaven, I guess I could, could say. And he's called the prince of peace. And, um, so he came, and it says here very clearly that the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, and it's just, we just have to try to understand it the best way that we can. But Jesus is deity as well as humanity, and it's very important that we understand that. Jesus himself said that he was one with the Father. I want to go to John 10, 30. It's a very simple statement here that Jesus said, the Father and I are one. He, he knew of his position with the Father. That's one of the things that made Jesus' time on the cross unbelievably unbearable. Because in order for God to truly put the curse of sin on him, lay all of the sin on Jesus so that he would pay the price for all of it. For the first time ever, God turned away from him. And Jesus had never known the sep separation like that. Um, it it would have been more than we can possibly comprehend how hard that must have been. Um, Jesus is eternal. Let's go to Revelation 1.17. Now, in this, John has just seen Jesus when he's getting the revelation on the Isle, Isle of Patmos. 
And he says here, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Ooh, I'm going to read verse 18. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in the grave. Jesus is eternal. There is a term that's spoken of, El Olam. Um, El is always a term for God. Um, and El Olam is that uh, he's the beginning and the end. I mean, he, he remember he already said in Revelation that, that I am the first and the last. Um, let's look at Revelation 22, 13. Jesus says here about himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In other words, he, as God the Son, has no beginning and he will have no end. He has not been created. He will never die. He just is. Um, we're going to see a scripture that says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, he was never created. Now, he came and was born into a human body, but that wasn't where he began. I think every single person whose life is conceived here on earth um, has inherited that spirit that was breathed into Adam and Eve from the very beginning. And so we become a unique person when we when the mother and the father's um, DNA and the spirit are just brought together and a, a wonderful new life begins this wonderful eternal spirit that we have in us but Jesus was different because when he came he was Jesus God the Son who came here and was born uh, you know as a human baby from Mary but he had pre-existed he was God the Son beforehand he chose to come for us. God is often referred to um, as Jehovah, or it's pronounced sometimes Yahweh, um, Jira, G-I-R-E-H, and that he's a provider. Well, I love how this is spoken of also about Jesus as provider. Let's look at John 6, 35. John dealt a lot in, in his account of Jesus with the deity of Christ. I think it's something he saw and was so taken with. He, he believed this and knew it, and, and he has a lot of stuff in John about that. John 6, 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes me will never be thirsty. So even though we know this right, in this instance, isn't providing um, physical bread, um, it is providing a filling of our life so that our spirit, our soul, are satisfied and at peace and, and um, not hungry or thirsty. Although if we go to like Jesus' miracle of feeding 5,000 and 4,000, he was pretty good at providing physical food too and physical provision. Jesus is the good shepherd. You know, um, David in Psalm 23, he was talking about that the Lord was his shepherd and all the wonderful ways that God took care of him. Well, Jesus is spoken of as a good shepherd. In John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And so it just says God the Father is referred to as a good shepherd, so is Jesus. When God is referred to as Jehovah Rapha, um, he is the healer. Let's see what we can say about Jesus in 1 Peter 2, 24. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Oh, wow. In verse 25, once again, talking about the shepherd. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So Jesus is a healer, supernaturally, powerfully a healer. Let's look at just a couple more here of just uh, things that we can know. What we had mentioned earlier, El Shaddai, the one who is sufficient. So let's look at 
2 Corinthians 12, 9 to see what it says about Jesus. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. In other translations, it'll say, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He is enough, just like God is El Shaddai. He is the Lord of peace, Jehovah Shalom, God of peace. He said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. He brings us peace. And then it was the Bible talks about Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And Matthew talked about this in Matthew 1, 23 that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so there's so many different ways here that we can see that um, characteristics of God the Father are also characteristics here of God the Son. Let's look at Philippians. I want to look at, at Philippians 2, like 6 through 11. Now, we talked about this scripture even just last week because it speaks of the Lord becoming human, coming and being human. But let's look at this also in terms of what it says about him as divine, as being deity, as being God. Paul says, you know, we need to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. And then we're going to start in verse 6. Though he was God... He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, God the Father, and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now, this is what happened after he was resurrected. You have to understand, he, he regained his position of equality with God the Father. After he'd made this sacrifice and had come and done this and fulfilled it, then it says, therefore, starting in verse 9, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It gives glory to God the Father that this is the position that Jesus now has. He was raised back up as being equal with God, as being part of the Trinity again. But the Bible, I mean, the Bible says so clearly here that though he was God, he emptied himself so that he could come to us. Just a little while ago, I, I made the statement that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, I want to give you that scripture that says that. That's Hebrews 13, 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I found so many scriptures. There's just reams of them <laughs> about Jesus being deity. Jesus not just being a nice prophet or a man that God sent, but that he is deity himself. Um, he referred to himself several times as the I am. Um, when he did it, when he was on trial, um, right before they crucified him, they knew what he meant when he said I am, to the point where they, they just ripped their robes and said it was blasphemy. Jesus knew who he was. And um, he spoke of himself that way. So um, he honored God the Father very much so. Um, when he was here and, and wants us to honor God the Father. And, and yet when we think of eternity and we think of where Jesus is now, God the Father is who he is and Jesus is who he is and the Holy Spirit is who he is and we can honor and worship and love and adore all of them. And, um, and Jesus um, gives honor to his Father. And it's, it's talked in here about how that God is honoring his son and the Holy Spirit honors them. So it, it's a wonderful, amazing, hard to understand, incredible relationship that becomes our God. 
And so Jesus was, though human, so much more than that, fully God as well as fully man. And I would love, I'm, I'm hoping that sometime here I'll go ahead and really get into a study that talks even more so about all the different scriptures that talk about the deity of Christ and what what the Bible had said he would be and, and who he was. And um, it's pretty amazing. Um, and all the different powerful meanings that these different names for God the Father and Jesus have. And there's a bunch of them for um, a bunch of neat stuff about the Holy Spirit, too. It's pretty cool. So, But, you know, as we're coming into this, this whole time of celebrating Jesus' birthday, and no matter what else is going on, even with the, the fun and the decorations and just the sweetness of the time, this is about the birth. Of Jesus we don't know exactly when he was born but this is just when we tend to celebrate specifically his birth and we have to know that you know I don't know exactly how I could compare his death and resurrection which we'll celebrate in the spring how to even compare that with his birth that we celebrate you know during this this month because they're both so phenomenal Jesus laid his life down for us and conquered death and the grave and rose again and is seated at the right hand of the Father in might and in power. And he will come again as king. There'll be no doubt about it when he comes back. But there's also this, what we call Christmas <laughs> celebration, where God the Son loved us enough to empty himself and come down and live all that we have to live. There's nothing that we have to suffer that he hasn't had some experience of. And, and humble himself to give a life of love and service and a bringing truth into a really dark world, but then also paying that price so that we have hope. We have an expectation because of his strength that he will always be with us. We can know that. We can know he will. There's someone that I love very much who is going through a really rough time right now about some things, um, with some physical scary challenges. And she said something that I think is so powerful. She said, I'm really learning the difference between hope and expectation. And she says, my hope is that I will be healed. But my expectation is that Jesus is going to be with me every step of the way, no matter what happens. And you know, we don't know what all is going to happen in our life. And we can, we can hope everything will be okay in terms of what happens in our life. But our expectation is that Jesus is going to be with us every single moment of it. And that will last all the way into eternity. So... Praise you, Jesus, that you were willing to come. Oh my goodness, Christmas is amazing. It is. Let's pray. Lord, um, I want to tell you that I am sorry and it grieves me that a time that should be about celebrating you has become about everything else, about, about a, a, a fictional character, about, about things that don't have anything to do really with you. This, this is about you, Jesus, and we praise you and we exalt you for coming. Please bring healing. Please bring reconciliation and forgiveness in families. Lord, I pray that we will be generous to each other and reach out in love and, and love when it's hard and forgive when it's hard and, and give when it's hard and help even when it's hard. And just do our very best with your strength to be like you. And Lord, may we have the generous, loving, giving, sacrificial heart that you have so greatly made an example of. You, you, you are the example that we need for that, Lord. So Lord, I pray that there can be peace, um, that people can be finding ways to forgive each other, and that there can be light shed in the darkness. And Lord, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I said, the sermon last week was so good. Oh my goodness, it's worth going back and looking at it. If you would like to join in on our online service, um, 
at our church, and we're being very careful, following all the careful guidelines and everything. Um, but of course, that won't affect anybody that's online. But I just wanted you to know we're trying to be a very careful church. But it's at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, um, Eastern Standard Time. There's interaction going on, uh, personal interaction, and uh, then it'll be on YouTube afterwards. I will have a link in the description below, and I'll have um, a orange circle with arrows on the end screen, and that is a way to find, um, to be able to get to the website, to be able to find the church services if you want to join with us. So, all right. Well, listen, be very blessed, and I pray you can find what I love to think of as just unexpected joy during this whole season. And I pray that you will come to love the one who came for us in ways that you never have before. All right, love you guys, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>